Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Jen Lee. I'm APTO's Director of Community Services and Partnerships. Uh, on behalf of APTO, or the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, I just want to welcome you to today's data resource training uh, webinar uh, using Community Commons to map and visualize the needs of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders for community needs assessments. Um, just to tell you a little bit about APTO, um, our next slide. The Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations is a national association of 35 community health organizations dedicated to promoting advocacy, collaboration, and leadership to improve the health status and access to care for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. We're also a Bureau of Primary Healthcare Training and Technical Assistance National Cooperative Agreement holder. Um, we're funded to provide training in TA that's data-driven, cutting edge, and focused on quality and operational improvement to support health centers, lookalikes, and newly funded HRSA awardees in caring for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. So just to tell you a little bit, actually, this is the second in a three-part series um, hosted by APCHO, focusing on really looking at the availability of data and strategic approaches to identifying and monitoring the needs of underserved Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islander populations specifically. Um, health centers often working with AA and NHPIs uh, frequently encounter limitations in the available data for our populations at the local and state levels, which often create uh, challenges also nationally when seeking to illustrate the needs of your populations for needs assessments, strategic planning, and or your expansion efforts at your health center. We know that a lot of you use multiple data strategies from community needs assessments to patient surveys and other partnership efforts to tell your health center population's unique story. We encourage you to continue to participate in our learning series. We have one more session um, that meets the following objectives. Providing access to new tools and data sources that support the monitoring and identification for newly medically underserved APIs and to share successful health center strategies and the use of community needs assessments to support the expansion of services for A and HPI population. Um, A and HPIs are among the fastest growing racial ethnic groups in the United States, expected to triple in size from 2005 to 2050, and are diverse in their culture, language, and health needs, representing more than 50 ethnic groups in over 100 languages. Today, we have the pleasure of having two representatives from Community Commons will demonstrate the use of their mapping tools for collecting health data for AA and NHPI. So the objectives for today's webinar are to learn about Community Commons mapping technology features and their needs assessment toolkit to identify ways that Community Commons tools can be used to inform a health center's community health needs assessment and to increase knowledge of available resources to, to your health center to improve your capacity to monitor and track the needs of medically underserved areas and populations. So today's agenda includes about a 50-minute live demonstration from our partners at Community Commons to really maximize the utility of tools, uh, and then we'll, that'll be followed by a brief Q&A at the end. Uh, should we run out of time today for questions, please just go ahead and type your questions in the post-survey that we'll be sending out, or feel free to contact any of us as a follow-up through email. Um, just a quick housekeeping slide uh, before we get started. Um, just to make sure you know how to participate and engage with the GoToAttendee webinar interface. Um, it's made up of two parts, the viewer window and the control panel. The viewer window allows you to see everything that we'll be presenting on the screen, and then the control panel allows you to participate in the webinar. By clicking the orange arrow, you can either hide or um, show your control panel. Um, for questions and comments, uh, for the duration of the presentation, all attendees will be in listen-only mode. You can submit questions and comments. We encourage you to do so during the presentation by typing them into the questions field on your control panel. And I uh, just wanted to let every know, everyone know that today's webinar will be recorded and we'll be sending out both the slides and the link to the recording after today's session. Okay. So with that, I'm um, just going to quickly move on to, to introduce our speakers. We are so excited to have Aaron Barbaro and Jamie klein -Sorgi joining us today from Community Commons. So Aaron serves as Community Commons Product Manager. She oversees the design, build, tools, and content on Community Commons. 
She's a master at balancing the needs of diverse teams that come together to make the site so fantastic. Erin has a Master's of Arts in Geography from the University of Missouri. Welcome, Erin. Um, I also want to introduce Jamie klein sorge who's been on the Community Commons team since their beginning, so she knows when to say they've been there and done that, and let's give it a try. <laughs> Serving as project director, she manages the hubs and is often called upon to lead and implement design sessions. Jamie has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Western Illinois University and a Master of Science in Rural Sociology from the University of Missouri. So with that, I'll turn it over to Erin and, or Jamie actually, and we'll go ahead. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so this is Jamie klein -Sorge. I'm going to be kicking off the webinar today and then turning it over uh, to Erin to go through our community needs assessment tool. So um, first and foremost, I just want to check that you guys are able to see my screen. Great. Erin's giving me a nod, so I'm going to take that as a go. So here we are on the Community Commons homepage. So for those of you who aren't familiar, who have never visited Community Commons, um, our URL is communitycommons.org. Um, so you're welcome to visit the site and follow along during the presentation. Um, one thing to note is that it is um, absolutely free to join Community Commons, but the tools that we're going to be using today during the presentation do require registration. And so we'll simply need you to um, up here in the right hand corner where you see my face, uh, there should be a register button and uh, you can simply enter an email password and a username and quickly get signed up on the site if you are interested in following along. So just a quick um, overview of the homepage and kind of what Community Commons is all about. So as mentioned, uh, we launched back in 2011 and have been growing our site ever since then. Um, one of the unique things that you can find on Community Commons and that you see here on the homepage um, are stories about communities who are using data to make change. And so um, we do have things like updates to our data that um, we turn into stories as well. So that's what you see here. Um, but we also cover a really wide variety of topics related to health, um, to the environment, and uh, physical environment, those types of things. So you can see here, just by scrolling down through our blog, that we have lots of stories. And I wanted to point this out because the one exciting part or the things that we like most about our stories is that um, they do include maps that help you visualize and contextualize the information that we're sharing. So you can see here that you can easily click on any of these maps that are embedded in the stories um, and enter our map room where we're going to be spending some of our time today. So I would encourage you just to uh, visit our site every once in a while if you're looking for inspiration um, or to see what else is going on around the country in terms of community health and community change. Uh, one way to easily navigate through some of our stories is this channels option up here at the top. Um, you can see we have a taxonomy, economy, education, environment, equity, food, and health. And so we have stories related to each of those topics that you're able to read through. So today we're going to be spending most of our time under this maps and data tab. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And um, I'm going to spend most of my time over here on the left hand side in the make a map portion. And then Erin uh, is going to take us through our community health needs assessment report over here on the right. Um, so first and foremost, um, I'm going to just go ahead and click on this make a map button. And what this is going to do is it's going to take me into um, the Community Commons data warehouse and give me an opportunity to search and find different data layers to add to a map. So one thing that I always like to note is that you don't have to be a, a geographic information system specialist or have any specific training um, in making maps or GIS in order to use our system. Uh, we're going to walk through some of the basic functions um, and skills that you need to be able to make some good maps today. So I don't want you to feel scared um, going into this. So a couple of things to start with. Um, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to search the data that you're looking for. So here you can see we have a couple of different ways that we can search data. Um, the easiest way is to search uh, by keyword or topic. So for example, um, you all are interested in specific populations. So simply by typing in the word Asian, I can find all of the data that we have that's specific to Asian populations. So you can see here that we have things that are related to owner-occupied housing, 
Uh, obviously, we have some general basic demographic population um, information, some unemployed workers. Um, and you can see up here at the top that we have about 127 different data layers that are broken out um, by Asian race. So that is uh, something that is available to you. And you can do that just by searching here in that search data function. Um, there is a previous and next button here sometimes that uh, catches people. They don't know how to get to find all 127 layers. So both of those are there. So I'm going to go ahead and up here at the top, I can click start over. So that was just using the simple keyword search. Um, there's two other options down here. So we can also browse data by topic. Um, so if you guys are, you guys are mostly focused on health related issues. So um, just by clicking each of these uh, different topics, you can open up some uh, different data sets that we have available. So you can see here under health, uh, we have some subcategories. So you can look at things like health outcomes um, related to cancer. And these are all the different state cancer profiles that we have available. Um, we have mortality data, so things around infant mortality and life expectancy. Um, so what you would do from here is you would simply click um, this checkbox next to any of these data layers to add it to a map. So I'm actually going to go back and show you one last way, though, before we add anything to a map to search our data. So a lot of times folks know that a specific source, a data source, has what you're looking for. So we also have that option available here at the bottom. So you can see here, browse data by source. And what that's going to pull up is all of the data sources that we have available. Um, so you can see here things like Bureau of Labor Statistics. They've put out unemployment data um, that can be useful to your uh, needs assessments. We have county health rankings data. Um, we've got USDA data, <clears throat> things uh, related to IRS. Um, so there's just a really broad swath of uh, data sources. And again, if you click on any of these, you'll see that these uh, actual data layers then populate underneath those topic areas. And you're able to click the checkbox next to each of them to add them to the map. So again, I'm just going to start over. And I know that there are a couple of um, you know, things that you guys need for your uh, needs assessments each year. And so I want to highlight some of um, the data that we have available that might be useful to you all. So I'm going to actually type in the word shortage because I know that um, health professional shortage areas is something of interest. Um, so you can see here by typing in that word, um, I was able to get all of the different shortage areas that we have available in our warehouse. And a couple of things to note here, um, these are all, these were all released in April of 2016. So this is pretty recent data that we can add to the map, which is exciting. Um, you can sort by release date. So for example, we have um, a pretty broad variety of American Community Survey data from the census. And we have some older data from the census as well. And so if you wanted to make sure that you were getting uh, the most recent data available in the system, uh, you can use this sort by feature over on the left hand side and choose release date and it's automatically going to populate the most recent data available to the top there. So as you can see I've gone ahead and checked the box next to the health professional shortage area and right now I want to look at mental health care providers. So down here in the right hand corner I'm going to click add to map. And what's going to happen is this is going to populate on the map um, of the full United States. And so we're able to see here health professional shortage areas. And then there is a variety of designations um, that you can see here in the legend on the right hand side. So from here on now, I'm going to pick a geography. So uh, we were lucky to get some of your all geographies um, to use during this presentation. So I'm going to go to uh, Lowell, Massachusetts to start. So you can see here that it's zoomed in pretty far, um, but we are in Lowell. I'm going to zoom out just by using these buttons over here on the left-hand side. You can see the plus and the minus. So I'm going to click that a couple times just so we can see the area around Lowell. So you can see here that we see that it's designated a low-income population um, health professional shortage area in that area. And so I want to go ahead and add more data to this map. So the next thing I'm going to do um, up here in the left hand corner, we have a tab that says add data. So it's going to take me back to that um, option to enter a keyword or browse data by topic. So I'm going to go ahead and I want to look also at uninsured populations. 
and I didn't spell that right, so let me try that again. <laughs> so this is a good example of um, possibly where I would use that release date sort by function because I want to make sure that I have um, some of the most uh, recent uninsured data that's available. So I'm going to go ahead and just choose this first one, though, that we have here. So uninsured population from the ACS. And I'm going to go ahead and also add that to the map. So now we can see we're looking at that health professional shortage area, which is now underneath the uninsured population layer that I've added. Um, and it is percent by county. So one of the nice things that's, um, or one of the things that's exciting about our map room is that a lot of the ACS data and other data layers are available um, at a sub-county level, which is all, always more meaningful for working with the populations that we serve. So over here in the legend, you can see where it says data geography. I'm able to click on that and I can actually choose a smaller geography. So I'm going to go ahead and choose tract instead of, um, instead of county level. So you can see how that changes the map a little bit. I'm also going to drag and drop this health professional shortage area on top so we have a little bit better view. You can see there's those darker areas in, in green um, that show that uninsured population there. And I can change that transparency and make it darker or lighter if I'd like just by using that slider there at the bottom. The other thing is, is if you ever wanted to get more information about the data or where it came from, we have these info buttons that are next to each data set. So you can see here that we get a description of the data. It gives you a release date. It tells you how often it's released. Um, what geographic units it's available at, and then there's a link back to the original source. So if you wanted more information about their methodology or about where it came from, you can always get that information. So here we're starting to paint a bigger picture um, of what maybe a typical uninsured uh, person looks like in this area. I can add a couple of other layers to this map before it gets too messy as well. So I'm just going to um, look at some mental health care providers. So we actually have locations, um, facilities of mental health care providers. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and add those to the map. Um, and I'm also going to add some poor mental health days so we can look at that. So you can see how we're starting to kind of layer um, things on top of one another. And so sometimes you want to turn a layer off. And you can do that very easily by unchecking the box next to that layer. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off that uh, uninsured layer so we can see poor mental health days. Um, it looks like this area is doing all right. Um, and then we also see some mental health care providers. Again, I'm going to drag and drop that health professional shortage area to the top so you can see what that looks like as well. So if this is something that you're working on, um, you would be able to tell a short story about how um, there is there are some mental health care providers in this area. It's still uh, considered a mental health care health professional shortage area. Um, and you could also add layers, again, like the uninsured population um, to help show that there are areas um, where folks are more uninsured. You could also add things like poverty um, to continue to make a case for vulnerabilities in this area. So I'm going to show you what this looks like. So anytime you make a map, um, you can also go to anywhere else in the country. So up here in this location bar, for example, I'm just going to go ahead and type in New Orleans, which I, I think there's some folks um, here from there. And so you can see what this map looks like. Uh, we got out of Lowell, and now we're in the New Orleans area. So you can see a little bit more of that uninsured population and how it varies by uh, census tract. And you can also see um, if you toggle the health professional shortage areas, um, where those lie in relation to uninsured populations and then also mental health providers. Um, so again, this helps you target geographies um, that may be uh, where there aren't a lot of services, but there is a lot of uninsured people. So this looks like this brown area in the left-hand corner might be an area or some of these um, other brown areas might be areas where you could do some uh, targeted intervention. So that's just one example. Um, you can save, share, or export this map by using um, these buttons here at the top. So we can save the map uh, to our profile. We can share it via uh, social media, or we can export it as a image file or a PDF document. 
So I wanted to show one more map um, before I turn it over to talk about our community health needs assessment. So I'm just going to go back to this make a map function and I'm going to add some layers here around food. So we have a lot of information um, related to food insecurity, food deserts, um, food access. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add some food insecure population um, from Feeding America. And so that's the first uh, layer that I'm going to have here on my map. And I'm actually going to go to uh, Hawaii and we're going to start there. So you can see um, now that we are, I'm going to zoom out a couple of times, we are on the great island of Hawaii and I can change uh, again my geographies. I'm going to go ahead and leave that as county um, and then I'm going to look at four food deserts in this area. And so we have some food desert census tract change information, um, which is pretty cool um, because you're able to see what used to be a food desert, uh, what is currently a food desert, and what is considered a new food desert. And so uh, those will populate here on the map and uh, we'll be able to see those areas as they come. There we go. All right, so you can see here that we've got um, some areas that are considered food deserts. So I'm actually going to make the um, area that we select a little bit smaller. So you can see um, this area specifically that we're looking at in Hawaii uh, used to, um, was a food desert and then it was removed in 2015. So it looks like they've done some work there. So maybe they've added a farmer's market. Um, and so I can search that and add farmer's market um, to that area as well. So you can see here that there is a farmer's market in that area. Um, we can also see if there's any grocery stores that maybe that they've added in that time. Just by searching groceries, I can add um, major supermarkets. Great one, I think. <laughs> so you can see how those populate in blue on the map. Um, so this gives us uh, some information about you can look at other areas of the island as well to see uh, where food deserts are new, um, where they've gone away, and where they've stayed consistent, um, and maybe see some of the changes that have been made. So before I turn it over, the one last thing that I want to show you is we do have some additional tools available to you um, within this mapping function. So you can see up here uh, where the add data button is. We also have a tools um, function and you can also get it right here under the legend. Um, so one of the things that you can do is you can query this data. Um, so you can see that you can uh, look up, uh, let's see here. I don't want that layer. One second. You can query the data um, to see food insecure population. Um, so we're going to select that and we're going to say uh, we want to see where food insecure population lives that is a percent um, that's higher, greater than a certain number. So we can run that query and it looks like I have no results returned. Um, so there we go. Now we have this total area that shows us since we're looking by county, it's going to give us that entire county, but we get some uh, interesting metadata from that. So we can see here um, the total population and then we can also see that total number of food insecure. So it looks like about 127,000 of 975,000 are considered um, insecure and that's about 13% of the population. You can show an attribute table of that if you're interested. Um, and then we also have some other tools in here where you can measure, um, you can mask if you're looking to make some nice, a nice PowerPoint presentation um, and you want to just show some specific areas of the map um, that is available to you. So I think with that, um, that is a quick rundown of our map room and what's available to you. We do have some support material if you uh, need any help uh, coming back to the map room and using some of those additional tools that I just showed you um, or simply making a map. Uh, we also have a map gallery that's available and these are maps that folks um, on the commons have made. So we have over 60,000 users. Um, who uh, rely on our, our map room to be able to make maps and they're able to save them publicly and you can access those at any time again to find inspiration or see what others are working on. So with that I'm going to turn it over to Erin and she's going to dive into our community health needs assessment. Great. Thank you Jamie. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I have that to my 
Am I on? There we go. All right. Okay. Hopefully you're able to see my screen. We have we're back revisiting this maps and data tab that you can access anywhere on the Commons. So if you remember, Jamie launched in over here on the left hand side of the screen with some of the Make a Map components, and I'm going to be spending time over here on the right hand side of the screen with some of our reporting tools. So the first thing I'm going to do is just click on this simple build a report link here at the top of the screen. I want to show you how you can build a report with a county or a couple of counties first, and then I'll go back and show you how you can create what we call a custom report area, which could be an area you draw or a series of zip codes or um, even a school district. But let's start with a county level report. So you'll notice that this is called a community health needs assessment at the top of the screen. But I uh, want you to know that we think there's a lot of value here for using these, this report tool beyond a community health needs assessment. Uh, any kind of community assessment that you're doing, I think you'll find a lot of value in the indicators that are here. Uh, and indeed, we hear a lot from our users about the different ways that they're using um, this report to apply for different grants, uh, for meeting regulatory requirements through community needs assessments, et cetera. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is pick a state. Uh, so I'm just going to jump up to um, Washington, and we're going to go to King County, and we just select that from the dropdown. Uh, you can select multiple additional counties if you wanted to create a region, but I'm just going to do a single county for now. And then we just go to View Report. And this is going to crunch through all of the indicators that are available. I believe the current count is about 136 indicators across all of these different data categories. And Jamie and I like to refer to these as chapters in a book. So we have each of the data categories you can think of as a chapter. So for example, the first chapter here is demographics. And then within the demographics chapter, we're going to see a number of data indicators, which you can think of as the pages in the book. So the first page that comes up under demographics is total population. And you know you're on that one because it's bolded here. And as we scroll down to examine this page, we'll see a few components. One is that the data are presented in text format. Uh, and this is easily copy-pastable if you need to use this elsewhere to drop it into a proposal or uh, some sort of report that you're doing. We also present the data uh, in a table format with the report area of the county, the state, and the nation. Now, if we had selected multiple counties, you'd get a summary for all of those counties rolled up together as a region. Uh, so that's handy as well. And the individual component counties would be included. Uh, notice that you can download this data into an Excel document. So I've done this quite a bit where I've created a report in here, but I download it into Excel. And maybe I load it into another um, data analysis program, or even just using Excel to run some summaries or create some different kinds of charts and graphs. So you are welcome to do that. And you'll also notice that we have the data source here, and always link back to that if you want to grab um, some additional information. Below that, you'll notice we have a map. And if you click on View Larger Map, this is going to open up the interactive mapping environment that Jamie was just showing you with all of the other tools and data to browse through. So that's a quick link to get you into that space. Now, underneath all of those pieces, you'll see where we've broken out the data by age, race, gender, and ethnicity. And we do this wherever we can with the data that's available publicly. Now, you guys know as well as anyone that there can be challenges and what kind of uh, breakouts are available, but whenever it's available in the data set, we do include it here. So here's gender, uh, breaking the data out by age. Uh, we also have um, pop or age groups um, as a table here, as well as a pie chart. Uh, race and ethnicity is broken out. Um, and then uh, also as a table, pie chart on a table, and then ethnicity race alone, um, non-Hispanic population, etc. And then at the bottom of the screen, we're going to have more detailed footnotes. So not only just the source, but also some additional information about any additional analysis we've done to this, um, specific calculations, etc. So we try to provide uh, quite a bit of information packed into each of these individual pages. So again, that was just the total population screen. Um, you'll notice as we uh, drill down, there's a number of different pieces you can take a look at. Limited English households, for example. Let's take a look at this. 
Um, as we browse through, you'll notice that a number of these indicators are going to also include these data gauges. And this is just simply to help provide a little bit of context to the information, because over time we've realized that just giving you the number 5.85% or 5.58%, unless you have some context or something to relate it to, it's pretty meaningless. So by providing a color code, for example, green or red, whether it's above or below uh, the state average in most cases, and you'll notice here um, that there's a note saying what things are compared to. So for the most part, we're comparing and indicating that red green based on the state average, and then we'll also include a gauge here. And we are taking into account, um, you know, whether positive, negative change is, a, a po you know, what direction the, the indicator is, whether it's positive or negative. And then as well, you can see the, the map here. And so the map is really important because while we're looking at the data here at the county level, uh, we know that these things are not evenly distributed throughout the county. There may be pockets of greater concern. So we're able to then look at the geographic distribution of this alongside um, the indicators here. So let's just scroll through a few of the other chapters. Um, here in social and economic factors, you'll notice that we have data related to, say, free and reduced price lunch eligibility. As Jamie uh, took a look at, we also have the um, uh, food insecurity rate. Um, we have uh, indicators related to poverty and educational attainment. Um, and just an, an, uh, a number of, of items here. Um, we do also provide some trend lines. We get that question a lot, whether or not trend lines are available. So um, there's a, 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 a section of data or a subset, I guess I would say, of data for which we have comparable data over time that we can provide those trend lines. Unemployment is an example of that. Uh, so we include uh, trend lines for a one year, so um, November to November 2017, 16 to 17 here we're looking at, as well as a 10 year um, rate here. And these are actually interactive, which a lot of people don't realize, but you can actually toggle these on and off. So if you just say wanted to see um, King County and Washington, you can toggle those on and off that way. Um, and again, each of these pieces is downloadable so that you can open them up in Excel uh, and continue to, to work with the data. All right, so let's take a look at a few of the other indicator sections here around physical environment uh, and clinical care. Um, so just browsing through, uh, looking at air quality, for example, this is another one that we have some trend line data for. Um, also looking at housing, liquor store access, um, clinical care. We have data uh, including access to mental health, um, access to oral health and primary care providers. Uh, a number of the data sets that when you're looking at um, the uh, clinical care and health behaviors, health outcomes, a couple things happen. One is that we're um, mostly only able to look at that data at the county level. Uh, and secondly, we have less uh, ability to look at the population uh, breakouts. Um, in terms of race and ethnicity, so just something to keep in mind. Uh, another just piece of context for community commons overall is that the tools that you're seeing here are publicly available tools that uh, we have available nationwide, which means that we're uh, in these public tools limited to using secondary national source data. So in order to have that sort of coverage nationwide, um, sometimes we can't do the, uh, uh, you know, while a particular state or even a particular county may present data at the, uh, with more granularity, um, we are not as able to always do that with consistency across the country. However, one thing I will point out is the ability to actually save and download these um, and bringing them into a Word document. And what we hope we will do is um, complement this with other uh, great data resources that you learn about through this webinar series um, or through um, you know, other sources so that you can kind of more quickly access the secondary data perhaps through community commons and then um, supplement that with some additional um, data or indicators you might be able to receive elsewhere. So we hope this is a good base. Um, I'll just browse through a few more here, looking at health behaviors, um, issues related to alcohol consumption, fruit and vegetables, tobacco, um, biking and walking to work, and then lastly, health outcomes. So um, looking at uh, asthma prevalence, for example, cancer incidence, diabetes, heart disease, um, infant mortality rate, et cetera. 
Um, so I'll just take a look at one of these items here. Um, and just again to point out a few other items where we're able to actually explore this in the mapping uh, tool. So one thing that we are able to do is, uh, for example, with this, we can uh, bring it into the interactive mapping environment and overlay it with things, uh, for example, from the 500 cities. Um, if you're familiar with that indicator set, uh, we can go to the add data, as Jamie showed you. And simply by searching 500 cities or even 500, uh, it will pull up all of the data uh, that we have integrated from the 500 cities project um, that you can then overlay and look at um, as part of the, um, the map that you're looking at. So for example, I'll add binge drinking to this. Uh, we can toggle this on looking at the tract level. And then as I zoom in, uh, you're able to see the tract level indicators uh, for the um, 500 city place, places that they've identified. Um, and then the darker areas here would indicate a higher percent of population or adults um, reporting binge, binge drinking. And then we can begin to overlay, for example, federally qualified health centers, hospitals, um, and a number of other data sets with this. Uh, back to the report, though, um, just a few other pieces that I will point out that are included is the ability to actually um, customize the report if, say, you only are interested in looking at a few of the indicators. Um, another piece that I think is really great is, let's say you really wanted to filter this down to only see indicators uh, with those race and ethnic breakouts. Um, that's going to be a much smaller list, but you can certainly do that, and that's going to filter down the entire report and only show you those indicators. Um, that do have that breakout available. Um, you can also save and download the report um, into a number of different formats. So I'll just click on this. Um, when you go to save the report, you have the option to um, actually save it as either a PDF document, so it'll be a static uh, piece that uh, is kind of locked in time that you can uh, easily print or share with others. Um, you can also grab a Word document. Um, which is handy as well, and you can do that for the entire uh, report or just individual indicators or even individual categories. So that would be either those chapters or those uh, pages. Um, and you can pull those down and they're fully editable so that you can, again, feel free to copy paste text, charts, maps, um, complement that with some additional context, qualitative information, narrative, or even um, some more um, indicators and data that you might have available. Um, you can also save the report to your Community Commons account. Um, so when you do register, as Jamie pointed out, uh, either your initials or your image will appear up here on the upper right if you've chosen to upload an image. And from that, uh, whenever throughout the site, you can always click to uh, view your profile and your library and any content that you've saved uh, will appear there in the library. So if you've created something you'd like to see again, uh, you can always save that back there using the save and download section. So that's a handy tool as well. I want to show you how you can actually start over, though, and create a report with um, a, a geography that's not a county, something that we call a custom geography. Because then I can show you some places where you can actually do some, um, some saved areas. Um, so let's just go, we're going to zoom into a location. I'm just going to go to Cleveland here just to show you what this looks like. So here, what the first step is to zoom in, and then you're asked how you want to define your custom area. And you have a lot of different options here from the dropdown. Maybe you want to draw a specific neighborhood boundary. Perhaps I want to look at just this area here. Maybe you want to look at a specific city boundary rather than the county or perhaps a series of zip codes, which is pretty common use case that we see. Once you've defined what you want to do, you can then click on those individual zip codes or city names or draw on the map, and you're creating a little footprint here that you're gonna use. So let's say this is my area of interest, perhaps this is my program service area, um, and I want to use this as the cookie cutter to create my report. Now let's say I'm gonna be doing a lot of things for this area. I'm gonna be con continually coming back and I don't wanna to have to click all these and cross-reference my list of zip codes every time. You can actually save that area and name it. So I'll just do that here. I'm gonna call this my Cleveland service area. And I'll just say this is for my project. 
And then I can save that service area. Perhaps I want to um, share this publicly so anyone else can use it, or maybe I just want to save it to my own personal account. I'll go ahead and do that in this case. Now that's going to appear in my list of saved areas. So I can very quickly come in and grab that and use it again later. So it's a nice little shortcut if you do choose to um, do that over and over again, although certainly you don't have to save it if you're, you know, something you might only use once or twice. But let's get to the viewing report side. So this is uh, now that I've defined my area, we're gonna come right back where we started. And we're looking at here, Cleveland service area, which is my um, zip codes that I selected and the entire county where my service area is within. Um, and if it covers multiple counties, you'll see those two counties as well, or multiple counties as well. And then we have the state and the nation. So the data are summarized uh, and estimated for uh, that area using a population weighted small area estimate. Um, and we can kind of take a look at what this looks like. Let me go to social and economic factors as an example here. So children eligible for a free and reduced price lunch. So if you think about this service area being the cookie cutter here to summarize the data, the Cleveland service area, which is this um, series of zip codes is showing a higher rate of free and reduced price lunch eligibility than the county, the state, and even the nation. So if I was uh, writing a grant or uh, writing a report about my service area, I would be able to explain and use this perhaps as a proxy for need or to otherwise differentiate my service area from the surrounding areas. So that's some useful context there. And then just like before, I could always go and add in some additional data to this. Uh, again, let's go back and take a look at the 500 cities data as an example, and perhaps let's see what um, something related to say, um, let's take a look at health insurance, for example. Add that to my map, and we'll look at this at the tract level, and then for the Cleveland area, I'm able to then take a look at um, the lack of insurance uh, coverage related to my area. One thing that you can do as well is, is have that report area come up on top. I do that often with my uh, reports that I'm creating, uh, particularly if I'm generating some, um, some uh, map images, uh, which I think Jamie showed, but you can also save each of these maps as an image uh, to drop into a presentation or grants as well. So that's kind of handy to be able to continuously refer back to that service area. All right. So with that, I think I'm going to turn now to take a look at the Vulnerable Populations Footprint Tool, which is a complementary tool to both the mapping and the reporting tool that you've taken a look at. It kind of converges um, both what Jamie and I showed uh, into a single tool. Uh, so that can be found here on the right-hand side of the Maps and Data section under Build a Report. And if we click on that, this is a slightly different report in that it's going to drop you um, and into a mapping tool that has less functionality. It's designed for one very specific purpose, uh, but from it you can do a lot of other uh, neat things. Um, so what we're going to be able to do here is actually type in a location. Um, so let's go, in this case, we'll go to San Francisco. Go ahead and type that in, and that's going to zoom me into that section. What you're going to see here is a vulnerable population footprint, meaning that areas in red have been identified as meeting the threshold of 20% of, of the population in poverty and 20% of the population without a high school diploma. Areas in orange mean that they meet the, po the poverty threshold, so at least 20% of the population in this census tract, for example, is in poverty as in terms of 100% poverty. And areas in purple here mean that at least 25% of the population does not have a high school diploma. Notice though that uh, here in this particular census tract, 28% roughly of the population does not have a high school diploma and 11% of the population is in poverty. So it does not show up as meeting both of those thresholds. So the vulnerable population footprint is just a way to very quickly identify areas that could potentially be higher at risk for poor health outcomes by those two indicators. Um, and what you can actually do is modify these. So as we use this throughout the country in different geographic areas, those thresholds may need to be modified to be more or less restrictive. So as we sort of continue to inch these up, some items are falling off our list. Um, and if we click on these individually, we can see that here, for example, let's see if I can 
click it. You might need to zoom in a bit further. In this particular census tract, we're looking at 63% of the population without a high school diploma and 36% of the population in poverty. So what can you do with this information? Well, uh, we encourage uh, groups that we work with to definitely use this tool to be cognizant of areas within the community that might potentially be at risk for poor health outcomes, particularly when doing community needs assessments, um, any kind of intervention in the community to definitely be sure to take uh, into account areas where there might be a potentially vulnerable population. Uh, we can do a few uh, additional tools with this. Um, one is that you can save these footprints to um, your personal profile to use again later. Um, you can create a short demographic report. So I'll just go ahead and click on that. And I can view this as an HTML, meaning a web page or a PDF. And this is going to show me within my map range, and I had zoomed out a little bit, areas that met my threshold. And it will remind me what the thresholds were that I set. And then as I scroll down, I can actually see the breakout so this is nearly 50% of the population within this footprint is Asian. Um, and I can compare that to the other races and ethnicities that are identified here. Um, I can see how many people live in these pockets. So we're looking at nearly 51,000 people. <coughs> Excuse me. I can see the age breakdown. Um, I can see the 100% poverty level, which was the one that is used for the footprint, but also notice this is nearly 63% of the population is in that 200% of poverty level, 38% um, without a high school diploma, and we're looking at nearly 40% of the population linguistically isolated. So with this, we can get some really interesting information, hopefully information that we can use to drive some intervention, some change, and some ensure that there is adequate support um, for the communities uh, and, and those that, that perhaps need some additional attention in this area. So that's just a quick demographic report, but you can do some initial, uh, some additional work here. Let me go back, I've got too many tabs open here. Um, we can also create an indicator report, uh, which would actually create a, a, a report just like we were looking at before when I ran through and we were looking at the chapters and the pages that would create that, but rather than using the county, it would use these uh, areas in that dark red as the cookie cutter to drill down through the data. Lastly, just to point out that you can also map this with other data. And this is something that we, um, we do quite a bit. This again allows you to have that footprint and bring that in as some additional context that perhaps you might use you know, months from now doing your work to bring in to uh, continuously remind uh, your stakeholders and your community of uh, being sure that we're paying some extra attention to those areas. So again, um, if we wanted to say bring in, uh, just to kind of come full circle with some of the pieces that Jamie had showed you before, um, to bring in say food deserts, um, we can do that as well. And look at that in the context of those vulnerable populations here. So for example, here, this is not a food desert. Um, perhaps some additional intervention or some activity has gone on here um, to ensure that this, this population has adequate access to healthy food. So that's terrific, that would be worth exploring. Um, and then we have some areas here that um, perhaps have not been identified as a food desert. Um, so like the other tools, this can be, um, you can save these maps, use them again later, um, and you can also um, continue to, to use these and share with others. So with that, I think I'm going to uh, turn it over to some of the questions pane. It looked like we have a number of questions that came in uh, throughout. So I'm gonna go turn to that and see if we might be able to address uh, some of those here. Great, thanks so much, Erin. Um, we're clamoring on our end. <laughs> How many exciting options there are. Um, so just wanna open up our question and answer portion for, for today and just as I mentioned in the beginning of the call, um, we are taking questions by the chat or the questions function. So if you look in your um, go to webinar control panel, there's a questions tab there. If you just click on that, you can shoot us um, any questions that are that are on your mind. So um, I think we have a couple questions uh, for you both. So our first question is, um, I think this would depend on the data set, but do your reports, do they have the capacity to break out 
Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander specific ethnicity subgroups as well? Mm. So not with, uh, I can't think of one of our data sets that does include that. I know that for some of the work that we've done in some, um, through some custom work, we have, for example, done some projects in smaller geographic areas where we're able to bring in some, um, some more, uh, uh, you know, data from local sources, data from even proprietary sources where we are able to do that. Uh, for example, a number of our clients uh, that we work with in California were able to access some additional data to kind of complement it. But with the core public data sets, um, I don't, I can't think of one off the top where we are able to break out the ethnicity. Got it, got it. Um, I think similar to that, uh, um, are there any of the data sets that you are aware of that um, may have data available by generation of immigration? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't know that we have, we, ha we do have some in migration and out migration, but I don't know if it, I don't think it probably gets down to the generation level, um, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, that's a great question though. I'd be curious to see. <laughs> and one thing I would point out is um, if, you, if there are data sets that are available nationally that, that you and those on the phone are aware of, we'd certainly be interested in learning about them. We're always working to round out our data. And um, so if there's something we're missing that's available across the country, um, please let us know because that would be definitely something we'd be interested in. Great. Um, okay, so next question is, um, in your map function, can you display population data only, for example, only include AA and HPI data for uninsured, limited English proficiency, and food insecurity? Is it limited to population data only? This is the question for the mapping function. Hi, I'm sorry. I think we got uh, cut off audio real quick. Could you repeat that question? Sure. Um, in your mapping function, uh, can you display population data only? Yeah. So let me go to maps and I will show you a couple different options for that. So um, we have in the browse data topic, go there real quick. Under civic, social, and then demographics, uh, if you browse by topic, um, that's that's the way to get there. Uh, we do have some um, options here. Predominant race, ethnicity, population. One thing with the predominant race and ethnicity, which is sort of an interesting data set, actually, I, I might show, um, is you can actually display this by uh, population. Um, let me go to location. So what this actually does, it's kind of neat, particularly when you overlay it with some additional information, is um, showing the predominant race and ethnicity from the U.S. Census 2010 data. Um, and it's showing the data at the block level. Um, so in, in other words, uh, uh, one point per, per census block. And as you drill in, it's quite interesting. I'm, I use this quite a bit when I'm looking at um, some other data sets that perhaps are not available to break down um, with that race and ethnicity breakdown. But if you can overlay some additional data sets, you can start to do a little bit of uh, at least some visual, um, uh, you know, statistically necessarily valid, but it's always interesting to kind of see if there's areas um, where uh, perhaps um, primary population is, um, Native American, Alaska Native, for example, and then we can also overlay that with some additional uh, data sets. So, um, and then as far as other data, uh, population only, you mentioned we do have uh, population density as an example. We can look at, um, let me go back to demographics and show some other examples. Let's see, that was, I think, total population. Um, we can also look at, let's see. Citizen population, age groups, race. Yeah, there's a number of different. Here's some of the migration data sets that Jay um, was referring to. So, did that answer the question? I think I think so. Yes. 
Thank you, Erin. Um, mm -hmm. Great. So just a couple other questions I think we have time for. Um, one question is, uh, when will the data be updated for the 2012 to 2016 ACS? Yeah. Good question. You want to answer that, Jamie? She's been answering that a lot. <laughs> so our data team is working on it right now, and we're looking at a release of that data um, probably around the second week of February. Um, it is the largest data set that we incorporate into the commons, and so it does take us a little bit of time um, to get it all in there and to double check it, make sure that it looks right and that it uh, that it gives you the correct number. Uh, we're working on that. We're expecting hopefully that that second week of February. Great, great. Um, and then I think other question is, can are you able to change the colors on the map yourself? You know, no, at this time, no. However, that's definitely been something we've hear, heard over the years. And as we continue to think about, you know, what tools we're able to offer, that's um, definitely something that, that, uh, that we've considered. In fact, in prior versions of this tool, we have had it. So who knows what the future holds? <laughs> we definitely have heard that that would be a useful tool, though. Got it. Um... Let's see. Okay, um, one last question. Is it possible to have AANHPI population data only versus displaying all the populations in the map? Um, so I wonder, I'm thinking from a, um, some of the indicators are broken out that way. Mm -hmm. uh, filtering, I'm not sure what the, yeah, some of the so filter. Yeah, if you use that, the, the, search function like I did at the very beginning, you can see what data layers we do have available that are broken out by um, Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander po uh, populations. Um, they are limited and we, you know, that's a limitation of the data collection. Um, you know, we're kind of just reporting what we're able to get. And so um, there are some that are available, but it is definitely a limited number in comparison to the you know, the broader swath of data that we have available. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So you definitely um, have in the map room would to be searched those keywords. So you can search Asian, you can search Native American, you can search Pacific or Pacific Islander. And you can see, um, you know, there's 127 here. I think there's about 150 uh, related to Native American. So um, that would be a good list to just get familiar with to see what is available. And then within the reporting environment, like what Erin showed you, there is that customized option and you can show indicators that only have that race and ethnicity breakout. And that will help filter that for you so you don't have to filter it yourself to see which ones are available um, with those ethnicity breakouts. I see. Got it. Yeah, I think that's often our challenge is to <laughs> really pull those things out to stand out. Um, that's yeah. cool. Great. Um, okay. Um, give one more call out for, for questions. Otherwise, we'll probably transition from this part of the webinar um, and go to closing. So last call for questions. Okay. Okay, <laughs> so with that, I um, just want to thank Jamie and Erin so much again today for the demonstration. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, so I uh, just wanted to um, thank everyone for their attendance today. As, as we shared earlier, this is um, the second in a three part series that APTO has been hosting to support health centers in um, getting familiar with new resources like community commons and um, also talking more about some of the challenges faced in the needs assessment process. Mm -hmm. um, so, just want to again uh, promote um, an upcoming webinar that we have, and we'll be sending that out after, after this session today. Um, our next and last webinar is scheduled for Thursday, April 19th, um, and we're looking for hopefully folks to come back and attend that one. We'll be talking with some health centers about sharing some of their best practices and lessons learned um, in terms of identifying uh, core needs for their health centers and sort of compiling and being creative with the data available outside of their um, patient data to, to tell the story of their health center. So um, with that, I just want to 
say thank you again so much to, to Jamie and Erin. Um, a reminder to folks, we will be sending out the recording after today's webinar, um, along with all of our contact information. I encourage you to, to reach out. Community Commons is a phenomenal resource um, and uh, publicly available, so you just have to register on their website. Um, and we're here at AppShow also to help you connect and or answer any other questions. So, with that, I just want to say thank everyone so much, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you in April. Thank you all for having us. Bye. Thank you.